Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, we're going to be working on chapter 10 of MCAT Biochem Review. And this chapter is all about lipid and amino acid metabolism. Now, we've talked about lipids before, and we've said how lipids play a major role in maintaining the structure and function of cells. However, they also have an important role as storage molecules for energy. So here in this chapter, we're going to explore the metabolism of lipids, starting with the ingestion of food particles and continuing through absorption, transport, and energy catabolism. We're also going to cover energy storage through lipid synthesis, as well as the metabolism of cholesterol and ketone bodies. And then we're finally going to learn about protein degradation and how it feeds into lipid and carbohydrate pathways and the urea cycle. So that's a brief overview of what we're going to do in this chapter. Let's go ahead and get started with the first objective of this chapter, which is discussing lipid digestion and absorption. So in addition to being a major source of energy in our body, lipids serve many other functions, one of them being a role as storage molecules for energy. Now, Dietary fats, those consist mainly of triacylglycerols with the remainder comprised of things like cholesterol, cholesterol esters, phospholipids, and free fatty acids. Now, in our discussion of lipid digestion and absorption, we're going to cover three big um, main objectives within that. That's going to be us talking about di digestion, us talking about micelle formation, and us talking about absorption too. So when we start with digestion, lipid digestion is very minimal in the mouth and stomach. Most of it happens in the small intestine. So lipids are transported to the small intestine essentially intact because there was minimal digestion in the mouth and stomach. Now upon entry, emulsification occurs. This is the mixing of two normally immiscible liquids like fat and water and this formation of an emulsion it's going to increase the surface area of that lipid and that's going to permit greater enzymatic interaction and processing now this emulsification it's aided by things like bile which is going to have bile salts pigments and cholesterol and it's secreted by the liver and stored in the uh, gallbladder <clears throat> Now, after that, the pancreas is going to secrete things like pancreatic lipase, colipase, and cholesterol esterase into the small intestine. And together, these enzymes are going to hydrolyze the lipid components to free fatty acids, to cholesterol, and also to 2 monoacylglycerol. That pretty much summarizes the digestion and absorption of dietary components. Um, mostly the digestion now one thing i want to also build on is this thing that i said about um emulsification and how it leads into my cell formation so as we said emulsification is um the mixing of two normally immiscible liquids emulsification is usually followed by absorption of fats by the intestinal cells Things like free fatty acids, cholesterol, 2 monoacylglycerol, bile salts, these all contribute to the formation of micelles, which are clusters of amphiphatic lipids that are soluble in the aqueous environment of that intestinal lumen. Essentially, micelles are just water soluble spheres with a lipid soluble interior, and they are so vital in digestion, transport, and absorption of lipid soluble substances. Now, Considering all that digestion and the, the formation of micelles, let's talk about how absorption happens, right? Micelles are going to diffuse to the brush border of the intestinal mucosal cells where they're going to be absorbed. The digested lipids will pass that brush border where they are absorbed into the mucosa and then re-esterified to form triacylglycerol and cholesterol esters and also, they will be packaged along with certain apoproteins and vitamins and other lipids into chylomicrons. These chylomicrons, they leave the intestines 
via lacteals, which are just the vessels of the lymphatic system. They'll re-enter the bloodstream through um, the thoracic duct, which is a, lo a long lymphatic vessel that pretty much empties into the left subclavian vein at the base of the neck. And so that's kind of how you want to think about lipid absorption, lipid digestion and absorption. All right. So with that, all right, with that, we want to transition into lipid mobilization. All right. So that was lipid digestion and absorption. All right. And here, this is a really important note that I want to mention, right? Your mechanical digestion that occurs in mouth and stomach. There's very minimal digestion that happens in the stomach and mouth all right most of the lipid digestion will happen in the small intestine this is called chemical digestion all right now these digested lipids like we said they can form micelles for absorption or be absorbed directly things like short chain fatty acids are absorbed across the intestine into the blood but long chain fatty acids can be absorbed instead as micelles and assembled assembled into chylomicrons for release into the lymphatic system, all right? So that's kind of our summary of the dig digestion and absorption of lipids. Now we want to move on to lipid mobilization, and I think this is an important distinction to make, all right, for us to, you know, stop and, and, and spend some time saying, hey, we're transitioning from digestion and absorption to mobilization, because what can be, you know, common MCAT questions is, you know, questions in regards to what enzymes are prevalent in digestion and absorption versus mobilization, which is a different set, requires a different set of enzymes. So that could be a very common question that appears. And it's good to be able to make the distinction between that. All right. Now for lipid mobilization to kind of encourage this conversation or, or inspire this conversation, think about your body at night. At night, the body is in the post-absorbative state, all right? And what that means is it utilizes energy stores instead of food for fuel. In that post-absorbative state, fatty acids are released from adipose tissue and they're used for energy. Now, human adipose tissue does not directly, you know, respond to that, but a fall in insulin levels will activate an enzyme called the hormone sensitive lipase, also known as HSL. And this HSL hydrolyzes triacyl glycerols and it yields, as a result, fatty acids and glycerol. All right, so when your triacyl glycerol through hormone sensitive lipase, it can be broken down into glycerol and fatty acids in the adipose tissue. Those can be transported to your liver. All right, the glycer glycerol in the liver can go, you know, can go under, uh, can be transported to the liver for gluconeogenesis or glycolysis. Um, and the fatty acids that are transported to the liver can undergo beta oxidation, which is something you don't know yet, but we'll cover in this chapter. All right, and through beta uh, oxidation, it can form acetyl CoA, which can either enter the citric acid cycle or it can be a promoter for ketogenesis, which is another topic that we will discuss in this chapter. All right, so it's okay if you don't know exactly what that means or what that entails yet. All right, you should know, however, you know, the process of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, because those are topics that we've covered previously. So you should understand how we can go from glycerol to glucose through, for example, glu gluconeogenesis. And then how glucose, right, can then enter glycolysis and be broken down into two molecules of pyruvate. Phenomenal. All right. So that is lipid mobilization for us. Now, there are other um, enzymes that can be prevalent in this mo lipid mobilization or lipid transport, if you will. And that's kind of what we want to lean into next, discussing a couple of lipids that participate in transporting things like triacyl glycerols or cholesterol, etc. Now, free fatty acids, free fatty acids, those are transported through the blood in association with a carrier protein that's called albumin, all right? Triacyl glycerols and cholesterols, those are transported in the blood through lipoproteins. 
aggregates actually of apolipoproteins and lipids. And that's kind of what this section is going to be all about, right? We're going to talk about different kinds of lipoproteins and what they transport and where they're made as well. Now, lipoproteins, they're named according to their density, which increases in direct proportion to the percentage of protein in the particle. All right, what we'll see is that chylomicrons are the least dense with the highest fat to protein ratio. All right, and then we have other things like very low density uh, lipoproteins, which is slightly more, um, which is slightly more dense, followed by IDL, which is intermediate density, LDL, low density lipo lipoprotein, and HDL, which is high density lipoprotein. All right, so we're going to get into all the nitty gritties of those right now. Okay, first and foremost chylomicrons all right chylomicrons they transport dietary triacyl glycerols cholesterol and cholesterol esters from intestine to tissues they are highly soluble in both lymphatic fluids and blood and they you know their main function is to transport the things that we just listed dietary triacyl glycerols cholesterol cholesterol esters all right and they do that usually from intestine to tissue, right? From small intestine where they're produced to peripheral tissues. All right, so that's chylomicrons. Then we have VLDL, which is very low density lipoproteins. All right, they are produced in the liver and they will transport triacyl glycerols and fatty acids from the liver to peripheral tissues as well. All right, now, that's the first, you know, comparing chylomicrons to very low density lipoproteins, right? They're very similar in what they're transporting and where their difference is where they are um, produced and assembled. Chylomicrons are produced and assembled in the small intestine. Very low density lipoproteins are produced and assembled in the liver cells. All right. Then we have, and it's not in this list, sadly, but we have IDL, all right, which stands for intermediate density lipoprotein. Once triacyl glycerol is removed from very low density lipoprotein, the resulting par particle is known as either a VLDL remnant or, in other words, IDL. Some IDL is reabsorbed by the, lip the liver um, through the help of apolipoproteins, on its exterior, and some is just further processed in the bloodstream. It's essentially, in short, formed from the degradation of very low density lipoprotein, and it can either be taken up by the liver or continue to peripheral tissue. All right, and so that's intermediate density lipoprotein. Then we have LDL, low density lipoprotein. All right, the normal role of LDL is to deliver cholesterol to tissue for biosynthesis. All right, that is the main objective of LDL. LDL delivers cholesterol into cells. It's formed from the degradation of IDL and transport, and, 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 and it transports cholesterol, like we said, from liver to peripheral tissue. It's often called, quote unquote, bad cholesterol because high levels of LDL in the blood can actually lead to um, certain conditions, certain bad conditions, all right, like um, I believe ether, um, atherosclerosis. Um, and then we have last but not least HDL, which stands for high density lipoprotein. This is synthesized in the liver and intestines and it's released as dense protein rich particles in the blood. It contains apolipoproteins used for cholesterol recovery so that means cleaning up excess cholesterol from blood vessels for excretion and for that reason it's called good cholesterol because high levels of hdl in the blood can protect against illnesses all right um it picks up cholesterol it delivers cholesterol um and it transfers apolipoproteins to other lipoproteins now we've mentioned at this point apolipoproteins, but we haven't defined it. And that's something that I think is important to also do. All right. Apolipoproteins are proteins that bind to lipids to form lipoproteins. They serve to stabilize the structure and to facilitate transport through the bloodstream. There are several different types. 
each with their own functions, and they're involved in the assembly and secretion of lipoproteins. While, um, and, and they're very important. They're very important for the regulation of lipids and cholesterols in the body. All right. So as a whole, you know, understanding apolipoproteins and understanding these different classes of lipoproteins are very important from the MCAT, right? Because they because they're involved in the transport of lipids and cholesterol throughout the body, and imbalances in those levels can cause significant health problems. They have significant health implications. Now, all that being said, right? We said these these lipoproteins they transport triacyl glycerols and they transport cholesterol. Let's focus on cholesterol for a bit and discuss cholesterol metabolism. This is something that we really do have to understand for the MCAT because cholesterol is a ubiquitous component of all cells in the human body. And cholesterol plays a really major role in the synthesis of cell membranes, steroid hormones, bile acids, vitamin D. You can tell that it's very important. Now, most cells de derive their cholesterol either from low-density or high-density lipoproteins, but actually some cholesterol can actually be synthesized de novo, which means de novo refers to the synthesis of cholesterol from simple precursors rather than from dietary source. And these simple precursors are things like acetyl-CoA and ATP. All right, the liver is the primary site of de novo cholesterol synthesis in the body. Um, now, the way that this de novo uh, synthesis is going to work is the following. You're going to have a citrate shuttle that's going to carry mitochondrial acetyl-CoA into the cytoplasm where the synthesis can occur for cholesterol. Then you have NADPH, which can supply reducing equivalents. And what will first happen is the synthesis of mevalonic acid in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. All right, I'm going to write that down. Mela, me, mevalonic, mevalonic acid in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. All right, now this synthesis of mevalonic acid in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, this is the rate limiting step of cholesterol synthesis. All right, of cholesterol biosynthesis, and it's catalyzed by an enzyme that's called HMG CoA reductase, where HMG stands for 3 hydroxy 3 methyl glutaryl. All right, so HMG CoA reductase. All right, that is the enzyme, the key enzyme in, cholest in cholesterol biosynthesis. All right. And it can be, in cholesterol synthesis, it can be regulated in a few ways. You know, increased levels of cholesterol is going to inhibit further synthesis through a feedback inhibition mechanism. Insulin can also have play a role in, in regulating where insulin will promote cholesterol synthesis. And on top of the synthesis of cholesterol, there are also specialized enzymes that are involved in the transport of cholesterol. These are things that include... LCAT or LCAT and CETP. Here we have LCAT, which stands for lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase. It's an enzyme that's found in the bloodstream that is activated by H HDL apoproteins. And what it does is it adds a fatty acid to cholesterol, which produces soluble cholesterol esters. All right. HDL cholesterol, uh, HDL Cholesterol esters can then be distributed to other lipoproteins, like IDL, which then becomes LDL by acquiring those cholesterol esters. All right, the cholesterol ester transfers protein is what CETP stands for. It facilitates that process. All right, so these are two enzymes that are important, specialized enzymes involved in the transport of cholesterol. All right, fantastic. With that, all right, and here, here's a, a little interesting schematic for that. With that, understanding cholesterol metabolism, we want to focus on triacyl glycerols and fatty acids now. All right, now, fatty acids, these are long chain carboxylic acids. Um, when describing a fatty acid, the total number of carbons is given along with the number of double bonds, and it's usually written in a form like carbons, 
dots, and then um, double bond. Double bonds. All right. And um, when we've talked about lipids before, specifically like fatty acids, fats, we've said that there are unsaturated fats and saturated fatty acids. Saturated fatty acids have no double bonds, while unsaturated fatty acids have one or more double bonds. Now, humans can synthesize only a few of the unsaturated fatty acids. The rest come from essential fatty acids that are found in the diet that are transported in chylomicrons as triacyl glycerols from the intestine. Two important essential fatty acids are alpha linoleonic acid and linoleic acid. All right, I'm going to write that down for us. Alpha linoleic acid and linoleic acid. All right, these are polysaturated fatty acids. Um, and they're important, um, and um, they're, sorry, these polyunsaturated fatty acids, as well as other fat acids that are formed from them, they're really important, and they're important because they help maintain cell membrane fluidity, which is obviously critical for a proper functioning of the cell, um, and for many other reasons as well. What we want to do now is talk about the synthesis. All right, fatty acids are used by the body for fuel and they're primarily supplied by the diet, right? In addition, excess carbohydrates and proteins that are acquired from the diet can also be converted to fatty acids and then stored as energy reserves in the form of triacyl glycerols, all right? Now, lipid and carbohydrate synthesis, they often fall in this category that's called non-template synthesis. Um, and that's because they don't rely directly on the coating of nucleic acids, um, unlike proteins and nucleic, uh, nucleic acid synthesis, which you do. All right. Now, our focus, our focus is talking about fatty acid biosynthesis. So I'm going to give you a general picture first. All right. And then we're going to talk in a little more details about some of the enzymes that play a role in, in fatty acid biosynthesis and also the general steps of fatty acid synthesis. Now, fatty acid biosynthesis, it's going to occur in the liver, all right? And its products are going to subsequently be transported to adipose tissue for storage, all right? Now, adipose tissue can also synthesize smaller quantities of fatty acids, but regardless, it will predominantly occur in the liver. Now, there are a couple of major enzymes that play a role in fatty acid synthesis. Those are going to be acetyl-CoA carboxylase and fatty acid synthase, and they're both stimulated by insulin. All right, acetyl-CoA car carboxylase um, is, is, is important um, because it prepares acetyl-CoA in, in the manner that it needs to be for this. So essentially, um, Acetyl-CoA is going to be activated in the cytoplasm for incorporation into fatty acids by acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And actually, this is the rate-limiting enzyme of fatty acid biosynthesis. All right. Now, another important enzyme in fatty acid biosynthesis is fatty acid synthase. It's also known as palamate synthase because palamitate is the only fatty acids uh, Palmitate, I'm sorry, is the only fatty acid that humans can synthesize de novo. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Actually, that could be a very common MCAT question, right? What is the only fatty acids that human can synthesize de novo? All right. Now, let's talk about the five steps that are involved in fatty acid synthesis. They're going to be activation, bond formation, reduction, dehydration, and then a second reduction. And I'm just going to give you the general overview of these steps, what you need for the MCAT, right? So you have your first step, activation. Activation. All right. Fatty acid synthesis, it starts with the activation of acetyl-CoA. All right. The acetyl group is transferred to a different molecule that's called an acyl carrier protein or ACP, all right, which is attached to a large enzyme complex called the fatty acid synthase. All right, so that in activation, you activate acetyl-CoA, all right? And to activate acetyl-CoA, you're gonna need acetyl-CoA carboxylase, right? 
And then the acetyl group is transferred to a molecule called ACP and it's attached to a larger enzyme complex. And that's called, that enzyme complex is called fatty acid synthase. Alrighty, so right off the bat, you see how those two enzymes are very important in the process of fatty acid biosynthesis. All right, so um, we activate, active, activate acetyl-CoA and, all right, um, we attach ACP to enzyme complex, right? And that enzyme complex is fatty acid synthase, FAS. All right, I'm just going to shorten it like that. Cool. Then after activation, that's the first step. After that, we have bond formation. That's the second step. All right, in bond formation, the acetyl group on ACP is then transferred to a molecule called malonyl-CoA. All right, this is going to form a four-carbon unit on ACP. Then that enzyme complex catalyzes. All right, it's going to catalyze the condensation of that acetyl group with the malonyl group to form a six-carbon unit. So the goal here, essentially, is you're forming a six-carbon unit. All right. Awesome. And then in this step, actually, it requires NADH, NADH, NADPH. It requires NADPH. Cool. All right, that's the second step. The third step is reduction. Reduction. The six carbon unit is now reduced by the addition of two electrons from NADPH, and it's going to form a six carbon alcohol now. And that leads us into the fourth step, which is dehydration. All right, the enzyme complex is then going to catalyze the dehydration of the alcohol to form a double bond between the two carbons. So you're going to form a double bond between the two carbons of that six carbon alcohol. All right, and then last but not least, you have your last and your last reduction. All right, the double bond is then reduced by the addition of two more electrons, and it forms a saturated six-carbon unit. Now, this process repeats, all right? It repeats these steps to elongate that fatty acid chain. And for the formation of palmitate, right, this, this process is going to repeat about eight times. All right, so that is the five steps of fatty acid biosynthesis. Those five steps get repeated to elongate that fatty acid chain. And don't forget that palmitate is the only fatty acid that humans can synthesize de novo. With that, though, we can move into beta oxidation of fatty acids. If you remember, I'm going to scroll up. All right, just hold on. All right. If you remember when we were talking about lipid mobilization, we said that triacylglycerol through the help of HSL enzyme can break this down into glycerol and fatty acids. And both of them get, can get transported to the liver where different things can happen to them. Those fatty acids, they can undergo beta oxidation to form acetyl-CoA, which can have, you know, go, go into the citric acid cycle or go uh, under ketogenesis. We're going to talk about what beta oxidation is now so that we can then move into talking about ketogenesis and even ketolysis. So that's kind of the progression of this chapter. All right, just reminding you so that everything makes sense and you see how these all are interrelated and tied from one thing to another. All right, so let's talk about that beta oxidation. All right. Most fatty acid catabolism proceeds through beta oxidation that occurs in the mitochondria. All right. So when fatty acids are metabolized, all right, they first are going to become activated by attachment to CoA, which is catalyzed by fatty acyl CoA synthetase. All right. The product is generally referred to as fatty acyl-CoA or acyl-CoA, all right? Now, to that, something that we should also know is how fatty acids enter into the mitochondria, right? Because that's where beta oxidation occurs. Now, short chain fatty acids, which are like two to four carbons, and medium chain fatty acids, usually six to 12-ish, they diffuse freely into the mitochondria, and then they are oxidized. In contrast to that are long chain fatty acids. These are 
fatty acids that are 14 to 20 carbons. They're also oxidized in the mitochondria, but they require transport into the mitochondria through what is called a carnitine shuttle. All right, and specifically carnitine acyl transferase 1 is, is what helps, and it is the rate limiting enzyme of this fatty acid oxidation for very long fatty acids chains, for, for long fatty acid chains. Now for, I guess, we'll call them very long fatty acid chains, so anything up beyond 20 carbons, those are sometimes those are going to be oxidized probably elsewhere in the cell. Beta oxidation, how it works in the mitochondria, it reverses the process of fatty acid synthesis pretty much by oxidizing and releasing molecules of acetyl CoA. All right, and this pathway is a repetition of four steps, and we're going to go over those four steps. All right, the first step. Actually, before we even get to the steps, there is one thing that I want to, to make note of. All right, there are four essential steps. We're going to talk about them in a second. What's the end? Uh, what happens at the end, right? What, what's the end products, if you will? Each four step cycle is going to release one acetyl CoA, and then it's also going to reduce an NAD plus and FAD2, NADH and FADH2, respectively. All right, and, and we know that FADH2 and NADH are oxidized in the electron transport chain where they can help produce ATP. With that being said, let us actually now cover the steps of beta oxidation. We first start with oxidation. All right, oxidation of the fatty acid to form a double bond like we see right here, going from starting material all right, to this. First step, oxidation. All right. Oxidation of the fatty acid to form a double bond. Second step is hydration. All right. Hydration of that double bond to form a hydroxyl group there. All right. Then the third step is another oxidation. All right. Oxidation of that hydroxyl group to form a carbonyl. All right. This is now a beta keto acid. And then last but not least, we have our acetyl-CoA formation. Here we're going to be, there's going to be the splitting of that beta-keto acid into a shorter acyl-CoA and an acetyl-CoA. All right, like we see here. Now, one thing to note is that fatty acids with an odd number of carbon atoms are going to undergo beta oxidation in the same manner as even numbered carbon fatty acids for the most part. The only difference is observed during the final cycle where even numbered fatty acids for the most part are going to yield two acetyl CoA molecules and odd numbered fatty acids are going to yield one acetyl CoA and one propanol CoA. All right. So that's just one thing to keep in mind here. Now, um, another note to keep in mind is that in polyunsaturated, in, in polyunsaturated fatty acids, all right, ones that have more than one double bond. A further reduction is going to be required using something like 2,4-dienyl co-reductase. It's going to convert two conjugated double bonds to just one double bond at that 3,4 position, where it will undergo the same rearrangement as the monosaturated fatty acids. Um, and so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Fantastic. With that, we move into ketone bodies, all right? Ketone bodies are compounds that are produced during the breakdown of fatty acids in the liver. They're an important so source of energy for the body, particularly during times of, say, fasting or low carbohydrate intake. And the three main ketone bodies that you should know, especially for the MCAT, are acetoacetate, beta hydroxybutyrate and acetone now ketone bodies relate to topics covered in this chapter because they're produced during the metabolism of fatty acids which is obviously one of the major topics we're covering here today right ketone bodies are are produced when the liver is unable to keep up with the demand for energy from the body right like that would happen uh, during a fasting, about a fasting, or during low carbohydrate intake. And they're essentially used as an alternative fuel source by the brain and other organs. Now, um, during fasting periods, what you'll notice is 
muscle will metabolize ketones as rapidly as the liver releases them and it prevents preventing accumulation in the bloodstream but after long bouts of fasting after a week of fasting even ketones can reach a concentration in the blood that's high enough for the brain to begin metabolizing them too and that allows us to transition into the two processes that we want to talk about and that's ketogenesis and ketolysis all right ketogenesis is the process of producing ketone bodies all right genesis production think of it like that and that occurs in the liver it's stimulated by low levels of insulin which signal a need for energy and during ketogenesis the liver will break down fatty acids into acetyl coa which will then undergo a series of reactions to produce ketone bodies and if you remember we we saw that earlier right acetyl coa can go um, and start is one of the starting materials um, for the citric acid cycle or it can go under or it can you know go down a different pathway down the ketogenesis pathway now catalysis is the process of breaking down ketone bodies to release energy and this will occur in tissues that can use ketone bodies as a fuel source like the brain and the heart all right the ketone bodies are then converted back into acetyl coa which could then enter the citric acid cycle to produce atp now one thing to keep in mind is that during a prolonged fast longer than one week the brain begins to derive up to two-thirds of its energy from ketone bodies all right so that's one thing that is important to remember very long bouts of fasting you know longer than one week your brain is going to derive two-thirds of its energy from ketone bodies now with that we get to transition into our last and final topic and that's protein catabolism proteins are very rarely used as energy source because it's really important for other functions and routinely breaking down protein is, is usually bad and it can cause some serious illnesses however under conditions of extreme energy deprivation proteins can be used for energy so here proteins can be digested and absorbed and digestion of proteins can begin in the stomach with things like pepsin and it can continue in the pancreas as well these proteins can be obtained from diet or from the body again during prolonged fasting or starvation and they can be used as an energy source body protein is um, broken down primarily in muscle and liver amino acids are then released from proteins usually uh, are, are going to usually lose their amino group through transamination or deamination, and the remaining carboskeleton can then be used for energy. So that's generally how that is going to work. All right, so let's keep that in mind. Another thing that we should keep in mind, um, amino acids are classified by their ability to turn into specific metabolic intermediates. So glucogenic amino acids, all but leucine and lysine, they can be converted into glucose through gluconeogenesis and then there's ketogenic amino acids um, those are going to include leucine and lysine as well as isoleucine phenylalanine threonine tryptophan and one more tyrosine all right those are all also glucogenic all right so that list of amino acids that are ketogenic are also pretty much all glucogenic except for lysine and leucine so that's that's an important thing to keep in mind now, also one more thing, the amino group that's removed by transamination uh, or deamination, they can constitute a potential toxin to the body in the fact that they can form, in the form of ammonia. So they have to be excreted safely. Um, the urea cycle does just that, all right? The, ure the urea cycle occurs in the liver and it's the body's primary way of removing excess nitrogen from the body to prevent it from potentially being a toxin to the body. All right, with that, we end our review. All right, next time we'll do some practice problems. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.